welcome. Welcome back. Uh, Happy New Year. I guess it's been that long since we've seen a lot of folks and done one of these uh, sessions. So thank you for joining. Um, for those of you that don't know me, this may be your first um, Take Charge session. My name is Marissa. I'm one of the um, cardiac rehab supervisors here. I'm also working kind of in admin here as well. Uh, and many of you have known Rob, uh, Rob Bertelink. So he was the, uh, the leader of this group for a while. Uh, he just retired on March 15th, but I'm hoping to have him back at some point in the future to say hello to everybody and still continue to pass on his knowledge. So if you uh, want to send him an email, I think he still has access to it. You're welcome to uh, say your, your uh, hellos with him. Um, but otherwise, we will, we will get started. Uh, so tonight, uh, we are going to um, talk about uh, falls prevention. Uh, so Amanda is here um, from Body and Soul Fitness. Uh, so thank you, Amanda, for joining. Um, so for those of you that uh, haven't been to one of these before, so Zoom is similar to Microsoft Teams. Um, what we will ask, we'll have questions uh, at the end of the session. Um, and then we will uh, ask you to ask your questions in the Q&A section. Um, so not in the chat, but in the Q&A. Uh, and then we can go through those near the end. Uh, if we start to run out of time, uh, I can take those questions. Uh, and if Amanda is able to answer them, she can fill them in. And then when I send the recording of the session, um, we'll include the answers to those, uh, those questions. Okay. Um, so just a reminder for these sessions, uh, these sessions are for education only. Okay, um, if you have particular questions about your own personal health, uh, then please follow up with your, your care provider for your specific concerns. Uh, questions will be answered generally, uh, not specific, okay, because we don't know your histories and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and that'll be it for today, okay. Uh, okay, let me just make sure we are good. Perfect. Uh, all right, so without further ado, Amanda, I'll let you take over. Uh, and thanks again for, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction. So as Marissa mentioned, we're gonna be talking about uh, fall prevention for older adults. Um, we're gonna take a bit of a focus on kind of exercise and what we can do in terms of uh, assessments and what kind of things you can look to do to kind of reduce your risk of falls and kind of improve your stability and overall strength. Um, so we'll go over a little bit of an outline and then I'll introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so today, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk just about some kind of key statistics on um, falls and the impact of falls in Canada. Understand a couple of kind of approaches to fall prevention uh, that exist. Understand how to kind of evaluate your risk for falling and what to kind of do uh, about that with appropriate interventions with your healthcare team. Um, we'll talk about some physical tests you can do with healthcare professionals or an exercise professional to kind of assess some things that are important to consider when um, looking at your risk of falls. And then we'll chat a bit more about physical activity and kind of its role in fall prevention, um, what kind of general uh, guidelines are. And um, we can do a little bit of a, a chair warm up if we have time, we can go through some kind of exercise that we can choose together today. So as mentioned, my name is Amanda. I am uh, a personal trainer and registered kinesiologist at uh, Body and Soul Fitness at our downtown location, which is located pretty close to the distillery district. I've been at Body and Soul for just over three years now. Um, I also have a stretching certification, so stretch therapy level one, um, and some nutrition. I'm also an exercise uh, is medic medicine professional. I've worked with um, many, many different populations, some special populations, uh, clients with um, herbs palsy and muscular dystrophy. I've worked with older populations as well, um, as well as kind of general population and various injuries. So um, I, I love working with all sorts of people. They teach me a lot about uh, just kind of life in general. And I've just learned a lot from my experience in working with um, different individuals. So to start out, uh, falls are the leading cause of injury uh, and injury and related hospitalizations in people age 65 or older in Canada. In general, fall related injuries are more prevalent in women compared to men. 
and in those who are age eight or older compared to the 65 to 79 kind of year old age range. So as uh, predicted, we can see that fall related injuries really impact one's quality of life, which can reduce your independence and increase the demand on kind of caregivers and also accelerate admissions into long term care homes or um, kind of other types of support. A lot of these falls do occur during walking. Uh, sometimes these falls are also pretty um, common to occur at nighttime if the lights are off and your vision is kind of impacted. Uh, so just some kind of things to consider. One initiative that exists um, kind of through the Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, in the States is something called STUDY. So this stands for Stopping El Elderly Accidents, Deaths and Injuries. And it kind of just outlines a protocol for um, fall prevention. So the first step essentially is to screen. So kind of identify uh, patients at risk for fall and kind of identify your own risk. Uh, second step would be to assess. So uh, what can we work on to reduce your risk? Uh, what things are making you more susceptible to a fall? And then the last stage would be to actually intervene. So using kind of um, strategies, both within your healthcare team, within your community to help to reduce your risk of falls. Um, and this is kind of a, a protocol that we'll kind of follow today. So first step, I've, I've linked this. And so when you um, uh, get the slides or the recording, I'll make sure to make all these links accessible to you. But this is something taken from that study initiative. Um, and it's kind of a quick check to assess your risk for falling. So the higher your score, the more susceptible you may be to uh, a fall or the higher uh, risk at risk you may be. So uh, they're just yes or no statements. So um, things like if you've fallen the past year, if you are apprehensive or worried about falling, if you have difficulty with certain um, activities of daily living or when you're out in the world getting up onto a curb or something um, that may increase your risk of falling. So it's just a quick check to kind of take a look. And then from there, we can kind of see and determine if you might be at an increased risk or if you are not. If you're not at an increased risk, according to this questionnaire, that doesn't mean that uh, this is not something to be on your radar. Um, and we'll kind of talk about the approach for both of those. So if you maybe are deemed not at risk, basically from with your healthcare team and or with kind of this quick just screening, self self screen. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still important to be educated on fall prevention, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's still very, very, very important to exercise um, with a community initiative or with a professional uh, for many, many benefits, which we'll chat about later on in the presentation. Um, if you do have any type of fall, it's really good to get reassessed uh, with your healthcare, by your healthcare team. Um, as well as vitamin D intake is good to discuss with your doctors if you aren't already, uh, just because this has a key role in kind of bone health and, and strength. So I uh, will chat about that a little bit on the next slide. Uh, vitamin D, as many of you may know, is really, really important for maintaining healthy bones. So calcium is a, is a big component of our bones and, require, and calcium absorption requires vitamin D. So vitamin D plays many roles in our body other than bone health, supports our immune system, uh, muscle function, because that's closely related to our, our structural integrity, our bones and our bone health, and also uh, brain cell activity. Vitamin D can be found in um, some, some of our diet, but mainly through fortified milk or fortified cereal, where that is actually added into um, those food sources, as well as fatty fish. Um, but may, our main source of vitamin D comes from direct sunlight. Uh, so as you know, this winter was not the sunniest one here if you're in Toronto. Um, so it's especially important to consider your vitamin D intake with your healthcare provider uh, throughout the winter when you might be getting less sunlight as well. Uh, so as we mentioned before, if you are screened and you're deemed maybe not at risk, uh, fall prevention education is still very, very important. So it's good to understand with your healthcare team about um, your individual risks as well and what you can do to prevent falls and to be vigilant. Um, so like we talked about exercising and, and staying um, with regular movement, uh, getting regular eye exams is also very important. As you can imagine, we kind of talked about um, some falls being more likely uh, in, in the middle of the night, maybe when the lights are off you're going to the washroom and there's a tripping hazard in the way. So that kind of also relates to the last point there of trying to kind of 
uh, do a little scan of your home and try to make it as safe as possible in reducing tripping hazards and things that might um, kind of get in your way. I just want to talk a little bit about um, the aging process in general and why it is extra important to exercise throughout your lifespan. So just in general, aging is associated with a loss of muscle mass and strength, uh, which can cause an increased risk of falls, um, as, and as mentioned, some other effects earlier. So bone density is, plays a big part in this. So that's why we talked about the importance of vitamin D, uh, also the importance of bone loading activities, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, sarcopenia is something we'll talk about in the next slide, and then just uh, age-related reductions in power, which can really contribute to um, increased risk of falling. So a lot of this loss of function can be prevented or delayed through regular uh, physical activity, starting with some specific uh, fitness testing to identify risks and to kind of determine what interventions are going to be the most appropriate for you and will help you the most. Um, and the earlier, the better with this, because uh, it's much easier to try and prevent something than to um, than to try and kind of fix something later. But there, there's never a point where it's too late to, to begin exercise. That's why it's really important to uh, seek help from a healthcare provider and an exercise professional. Oops, sorry, um, to see what's the, the most appropriate for for you and your individual factors. So uh, low bone mineral density uh, can lead to something called osteoporosis, which, which I'm sure you have heard about. And this is just typically characterized by low bone mineral density. So our bones are our structure. Our bones are kind of our foundation that provides support for our muscles and soft tissues, like our ligaments and tendons to work and act as levers to, to cause movement. So um, as I mentioned, uh, strengthening exercises and bone loading exercises or impact exercises, if safe for you to do, are one of the best ways to keep your bone mineral density from deteriorating, um, as well as vitamin D intake like we talked about. Unfortunately, women do uh, tend to suffer a little bit more from this, um, and especially during the uh, premenopausal time or perimenopause. Um, women can lose bone mass at a rate of approximately 1% per year. So exercise really can help to offset this. Uh, this does happen for men as well, um, but it's less, it's less clear when the kind of age of onset occurs for men, but probably around the same time, like um, kind of like middle age into the fifth and sixth and uh, seventh decades of life. Sarcopenia is another point I want to talk about. So this is the age-related loss of skeletal muscle mass and strength. Um, can also be associated with increases in body fat as well. Um, and this typically happens for everybody, men and women, start, can start as early as the fourth decade of life and um, can increase quite quickly up into the eighth decade of life. So just, again, really stresses the importance of uh, appropriate strength training and exercise to help to mitigate some of this. And the last point here um, of just about the aging process is the fact that uh, our power output, our capacity to exert force over a short period of time can really decrease with age. Um, so this is related to what we just talked about uh, decreases in bone density and also that, that process of sarcopenia uh, reduces in muscle mass. But this also can relate to our nervous system. So our brain's connection to our muscles, um, which has a big impact on our ability to say, uh, change direction quickly or catch ourselves if we do fall or, or we're about to fall. So this is something that can be trained just like strength, just like um, car, uh, cardiorespiratory fitness, and we'll talk about this uh, and when we talk about kind of exercise programming in general. There are a couple of different test batteries that exist out, out there. Um, from the study initiative that we talked about earlier, they suggested uh, four different tests that can be used to assess different components that impact um, your risk for falling. So starting with the eight foot up and go test, which we'll go over, a sit to stand test, six minute walk test and a Romberg test. Um, and then there is uh, the seniors fitness test battery from the American College of Sports Medicine, 
which includes a couple other tests we'll talk about that also include uh, stuff for upper body, which um, definitely is still important for just overall fitness and health. Um, but these four that I just mentioned are, are very, very specific to fall prevention. So we'll go over all of them. Goal of testing here is really to develop a very specific and indiv individualized treatment approach for you that aims to um, improve and um, improve kind of any limitations or any struggles that you have with various aspects of your fitness um, to improve your quality of life, improve your performance of your activities of daily living, and obviously to reduce your risk of falling as well. So starting with the seniors uh, fitness test battery, this consists of seven different tests for uh, upper and lower body strength, flexibility, cardiorespiratory fitness or endurance, agility, which is really related to power. That's kind of our ability to uh, exert force quickly and to change direction quickly and to also uh, connect kind of our brain with our muscles and then a, a balance test as well. So these have been selected because they're pretty easy to administer. They require very little equipment, um, but I would still recommend that you do these tests with an exercise professional. Um, we're going to be mainly focused on the, the previous four that I mentioned in the other slide. I have some videos um, for them. Hopefully they work today, but if not, I'll, we'll get you the link uh, so that you can take a look at them. They're on our Body and Soul website, um, and I'm just filmed them, the, the purpose of them and the administration of the test so you can see. Um, the, the, uh, 30 second arm curls test upper body strength and endurance. So essentially this is sitting in a chair. You're going to do as many bicep curls as you can in 30 seconds. Um, it is eight pounds for men and five pounds for women. So this tests your upper body strength and endurance. And, uh, this is related to, uh, this can predict your performance, sorry, in, uh, activities like carrying groceries, picking something up, picking up a child. Uh, so this can be very important if, if you are weaker in this test that we can do some specific strength training for that. Um, we'll go over the eight foot up and go test and the six minute walk test. Two minute step test is one that can be used to assess aerobic endurance and balance. It is a little bit more challenging because of uh, the balance component. So uh, in my experience, I like to use a six minute walk test to assess aerobic endurance. Um, and it's fairly easy to do. Uh, it doesn't require too much stability or balance. Uh, sit and reach test is another one that can be used to assess the flexibility of your low back and your hamstrings, um, which is important for strength development in those muscles. And we use those muscles a lot when we're, uh, or at least our hamstrings, when we're walking, running, cycling, and stair climbing. And then one more thing that might not be really related to our um, fall prevention is a back scratch test. So essentially this is kind of reaching behind your back like this and assesses your shoulder range of motion, um, but very, very important for um, shampooing your hair in the shower or reaching back and putting on a coat or putting something into your back pocket. So as mentioned, let's focus on the eight foot up and go test, the six minute walk, walk test. Uh, the 30 second chair stand, and then we'll talk about the Romberg test, which is a balance test as well. Um, but let, as I mentioned, the point of these tests is to be able to develop uh, an individual uh, plan for you to improve in these areas if you are uh, a little weaker on some uh, or you just want to improve. But there are some normative data that exists um, that kind of define a, a minimum level of capacity or, or sorry, a level of capacity required within your age range within each of these domains in order to uh, kind of predict independence up into age 90. So um, scoring less than or equal to the 25th percentile of these age-based norms may be considered low functioning that could predict future impairment limitations or future disability and would be definitely cause for some sort of intervention with your health and exercise care team. Um, there's also a link here too, so you can take a look at kind of what that looks like if you're able to do some of these tests with a, an exercise professional um, and kind of develop a plan from there. I don't know if this is gonna work, but there is me standing. I can kind of explain, as I mentioned, let's, uh, you can take a look at these short videos after to kind of see a demonstration of the test. Um, but the eight foot up and go test it has a couple components. So you'll start in a chair. Um, it's best that that chair is against the wall. Uh, so it's stable. You're gonna stand up from the chair. You're gonna walk to a, a cone or a marker that's eight foot away. 
eight feet away, sorry, and you're gonna circle it, come back down and sit into the chair. So this does assess your power and agility, your dynamic balance and your gait, um, which is very, very crucial in fall prevention. And you could time and uh, time your the time it takes you to, to complete this test and compare that to some of the norms that exist out there. Um, again, so sorry the video is not working, but hopefully we can pass over these slides and you can take a look and I'll give you the link to our website with them. Um, there's a 30 second sit to stand test. So this is essentially however many um, times you could sit into a chair and stand up without use of your arms. So arms crossed over your chest and uh, you would just count the amount of times you're able to do that in 30 seconds. So this is really important for lower body strength and endurance of your quads, of your glutes, of your hamstrings. Um, and this is definitely crucial to many activities of daily living, sitting down into to your dining chair, uh, sitting onto the toilet, um, and just kind of transfer activities as well, getting into a ch uh, car even. Now that's a very flattering uh, thumbnail there. <laughs> um, the six minute walk test uh, can be done inside or outside. So essentially it is the maximum distance that you can cover in six minutes. Um, we'll also take a look at your heart rate. So we'll take a look at your heart rate before the test immediately after the test and then one minute after the test. So this gives us an idea of your heart rate recovery um, and your ability kind of uh, to uh, tolerate that amount of exercise. And this can be used for prescriptions for your um, endurance or your aerobic activity, such as walking, uh, cycling, uh, aerobics or swimming, whatever you enjoy to do. Um, lastly, the wrong word test, I couldn't find a good picture of this, but essentially this is just a balance test um, and we can do it in a couple different ways. So uh, the stage one is just standing with two feet, seeing if you can uh, stand there without swaying. The second level would be essentially to close your eyes. So you reduce your visual output and see how you can balance because obviously our visual system is very important in um, our proprioception and our awareness of our position in the world. Um, so if there are any challenges there, that can be helpful to design a good program, a balance program, uh, especially if um, you have to kind of find some balance or, or, or have walk around in, in different situations where you might not have as much light, such as at dusk or at nighttime. Um, and there are some more advanced versions of this where we take a different stance, but, um, but that's a good kind of place to start with the Romberg test. Just wanted to go over a couple um, definitions. I've been throwing around these terms. Um, so physical activity in general is kind of any bodily movement produced by your body, by your skeletal muscles that requires energy, essentially. Um, we also define exercise as planned physical activity. So maybe physical activity is uh, walking to the grocery store, grabbing your groceries and carrying them back. But maybe exercise is something that's a planned and structured physical activity that you do, say, with your exercise provider. You go to um, some sort of exercise class or you go see uh, someone at the rehab center. Um, that would be kind of more exercise. Aerobic physical activity basically is something that's very dynamic and rhythmic in nature that uses a lot of your body's uh, large muscles if possible. Um, and this will improve CRF, which is your cardiorespiratory fitness. So basically your, your heart and your lungs ability to um, deliver blood flow and oxygen to your working muscles and your muscles ability to use that oxygen to um, do work essentially, so to do exercise. So examples of that include walking, running, swimming, cycling, uh, aerobic work, anything that really gets your heart rate up. Keep kind of skipping ahead. Um, and uh, yes, so bone strengthening activity uh, is really anything that might require some resistance. So strength training, um, it can also be aerobic physical activity, especially if it's weight bearing, um, but whatever is appropriate for you. And these activities can definitely be modified to your individual circumstances and what's, what's the best, what makes the most sense for you. Balance training would be essentially anything that is specifically designed to challenge your balance and to um, maybe destabilize you a little bit so that you are able to kind of catch yourself. And um, so we can play around with like different 
uh, inputs you're getting, such as like closing your eyes, like we talked about, that makes your balance a little bit more challenging. Uh, but training that can help you when you are in situations where, like we said, you maybe don't have as much light. Just in general, physical activity has many, many benefits. Um, first of all, it can reduce your risk of adiposity or gaining excess body fat in all cause and cause specific mortalities. It improves your bone health, as we've discussed, your cardiometabolic health, and uh, your, some cognitive outcomes as well. Prevention of other diseases, reducing risk of falls, that's why we're here, and um, improve qual health related quality of life. Also reduces risk of other diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. Um, overall, just improve physical fitness, function, confidence, and independence. And also, as we mentioned, a reduced risk of osteoporosis. Um, so in general, uh, we're going to go over some physical activity recommendations. Um, as Marissa mentioned, and I mentioned earlier, these are just general recommendations, um, but it's best practice to re review what, what makes the most sense for you, what is the best plan for you with your healthcare team and your exercise professionals. Um, so it's recommended that older adults uh, participate in some sort of physical activity um, on three or more days a week to help to enhance physical and functional capacity and to prevent falls. So a few components that are very important, which we'll chat about, um, but anything that combines a challenge to your balance, your strength, your endurance, uh, agility, and also um, kind of power training too. Um, there, there does exist an inverse dose response relationship between the volume of aerobic physical activity and the risk of physical functional uh, limitations in older adults, meaning uh, typically, the more exercise that you do, the lower that your risk would be of functional limitations. So more, there is more benefit to doing more if that's appropriate for you to do so. Um, we can break it down in terms of the different types of exercise as well. So for aerobic exercise, like we talked about, where you're getting your heart rate up, it's rhythmic in nature. Uh, it's recommended to do this three to five or more days per week at a moderate or in vig to vigorous intensity. So um, everybody's moderate to vigorous is going to be a bit different. That's going to be individual to you. And it might be hard to use a scale like that. Like what's a five to six out of 10? What's a seven to eight out of 10? For aerobic activity, the, the best test I think to use is called the top test. It's pretty simple. So something that's a moderate intensity would be where you feel like your heart rate's up. You feel like you're getting a little bit warm, but you're able to hold a conversation, not with great ease, but it's not super, super difficult to have a conversation. Once we get into that kind of vigorous zone, it's definitely, you're a bit more breathless. So it's it's pretty hard to hold a normal conversation uh, and that's kind of like your vigorous zone. So somewhere in between that would be best, but it's always best to uh, take it slow and see what's, what's most appropriate for you. Um, one more thing about the talk test, they say that at the moderate intensity, so you could talk, but you can't, you couldn't sing or yell. I haven't tested that out yet, just um, just knowing about the kind of uh, the ease of the conversation. Um, in terms of time, it's recommended to have like 30 to 60 minute sessions, uh, basically depending on your uh, intensity. Typically you can do a uh, shorter duration if the intensity is a little bit higher and longer duration to kind of get this, a similar benefit if the intensity is a bit lower, more that like moderate zone. We talked about kind of the different types of um, exercise you could do for aerobic. And then for resistance or strength chain, strength training, sorry, those are kind of used interchangeably. Uh, it's recommended to participate in that two or more days a week so that you can hit each of the muscle groups at least twice uh, a week. That's gonna be the most effective. Um, in terms of intensity there, uh, we can take a look at kind of um, how many uh, repetitions you could do. So light to moderate. So maybe a light intensity is a weight of something like an exercise where you can do it for maybe like 12 to 20 reps. It's a pretty big range, but um, it's not crazy, crazy difficult. Progressing to loading that a little bit more for a weight that, for a weight that you could do for like eight to 12 repetitions. Um, all these specifics are uh, best designed by an exercise professional who knows kind of um, your, your limits and where you're at, and they'll know how to progress you through a program so that you can see results 
and that you don't go, um, that the intensity is just right for you. Uh, typically like one to three sets of, of these uh, per exercise would be great. And it's always good to kind of ease into it. Um, maybe start a little slower and see how you respond and then kind of go from there. Um, this also will include those balance or uh, agility and proprioception exercises too. And then lastly, flexibility is a really important component of our musculoskeletal health. Honestly, it says at least twice, uh, two days per week, sorry, but every day is going to be the most optimal. Um, a big thing that I see with people is that they don't like stretching because they overstretch. Like they push the point that it's really uncomfortable. And if you're doing that, ease off a little bit. It should not feel like your muscles are going to rip. It should be mildly like uh, uncomfortable, um, but really not uh, excruciating. Uh, your facial expression shouldn't really change. You shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't hold your breath, sorry, because uh, that might mean you're going a little bit too intensely. Um, typically like 30 to 60 seconds per muscle group can be great, uh, especially after your exercise, when you're nice and warm, it can be really, really effective. Um, okay, so we can go through, I don't know, I can't see any of you, but uh, I can kind of take you through maybe just the warm up today that we can all do if you're seated in a chair. Um, I just wanted to kind of show you a, a sample program that you could do even like in your chair with the support of your chair, um, if appropriate, but let's just do the warm up today and uh, kind of go from there. So make sure that you can see me a little bit. We can start with some neck stretches. This is also really good, uh, work break, a little movement break too, if you're sitting at your desk and you feel like you just need to move a little bit. Uh, we can start with your ear towards your shoulder. If that's a nice stretch, hang tight there. If you want a little more, you can take your hand on the same side. You can just apply gentle, gentle over pressure. And what we can do here is we can just take a couple of deep breaths, really trying to expand your rib cage, exhale and try and sink into that stretch. So this one's gonna be for your upper trapezius muscle. Next one we can do is we can do the same thing, tilt the ear towards the shoulder, and then just turn your head down a little bit towards your opposite foot. Now, if, you, if that's a good stretch, hang tight, or you can grab your hand and pull more from behind. Uh, and you might feel this more at the back of your neck. Couple deep breaths there. Last one we can do, I can take my left hand, put on my right uh, right side of my chest, and I'm gonna look up and away from that hand. I'm gonna feel this more in the front of my neck here. Same thing, just a couple deep breaths. Good, and we can do the other side, otherwise it's gonna feel weird. Um, so let's go ear towards other shoulder. See how that feels. If you want a little slight, slight over pressure, you can apply a bit more pressure here. Couple deep breaths. And then you can turn your head down towards your right side, grab more from behind. Feel that more in the back of the neck. Good, and then last one, you're gonna look which way, this way, up and away, and then put your hand on your opposite side of your chest, looking up kind of on a diagonal, feeling that kind of right here. Okay, perfect. The next one we can do is a seated chest opener. So you can interlock your uh, fingers behind your back if you have access to that range. You can open up the chest towards the ceiling, feeling that stretch across the chest, hold that for a couple. And then what we can do is you can put your hands on your thighs, and you can kind of push your um, back towards the wall, feel kind of stretch between your shoulder blades. And we can repeat that a couple of times, open up the chest and then push kind of into like a, it was like a cat cow, cat camel. I don't know, I guess this is a scared cat or something, but some of the exercise names are funny. You can call it whatever you like. Good. Open up the chest again if you have access. You can even just reach behind you if that's more accessible. And then big exhale, push out kind of through the shoulder blades. Next, we can kind of go into some twists. So you can place your hands wherever is comfortable. You can place them um, across your chest, fingertips behind your ears. And we're going to try and keep your feet flat on the ground if you can. And we're going to just turn as far as you can one way. 
and then turn as far as you can the other way. I'm tighter on this side for sure. But our spine definitely craves some good movement, especially if we've been kind of uh, seated at the desk all day. You can do that one a couple of times. And perfect. Um, next one, we're going to do a little hip opener. So this is a figure four stretch. Hopefully you can kind of see me here. So if you can, we can like put cross your uh, leg over your other leg. And then I'm going to feel this in my hip here. You can just let, lean forward a little bit, kind of feeling this in your glutes of that leg that's crossed over. So you can hold this for a few seconds, a couple deep breaths. Nice, let's try the other side. Same thing, kind of sitting nice and tall and then leaning forward a little bit. Couple deep breaths here. Okay, perfect. And the last two are standing. If you um, are able to stand, you wanna try them, go right ahead. Um, I'll just show you, one's gonna be a hip flexor stretch, just using your chair for support. So I'm gonna hang on here. I am going to send my right leg back behind me a little bit, kind of into a staggered stance. And my right hand is gonna reach up into this side. So if I step back here, I'm gonna feel this stretch over this back hip a little bit and can reach tall into the side. A couple deep breaths here too. Perfect. And then the last one we can do a little bit hard for you to see me, sorry, I apologize, uh, is a hamstring stretch, still supported by your chair. So I'm gonna put this leg straight and then I'm just gonna send my hips back uh, towards the back wall behind me. And I'm gonna feel a bit of a stretch down the back of my thigh. Honestly, you probably don't need to, to bend too far forward to feel a good stretch. And you can flex your foot as well, toes up towards your shin of that straight leg that you're stretching and just sit back into your hips here. You can stand up, you can do that again. Exactly. So that's kind of a nice warm up, or like I said, a movement break that you can do. Um, I have kind of another sample exercise program, but if you have any questions about that, let me know. As mentioned, it's just uh, a general program. It's definitely best to be um, assessed for um, by an exercise professional to see what is best for you. But just in general, this is kind of a bit of a uh, a circuit that focuses on, you know, sit to stand, like we talked about the sit to stand test, which will work your quads and your glutes and your ability to get uh, to transfer out of chairs. Um, you can do a hamstring curl with a towel, uh, some marching in the second group of exercises for your hip flexors, uh, biceps curl. So that would transfer over directly to performance in that uh, 30 second arm curl test, a leg extension for your quads, some shoulder work, and then going into some calf work and some single leg balance uh, with some support of a chair or a wall, uh, but just trying to hold um, standing on one leg for as long as you can. So uh, that's everything for me. And I, I see we have a couple of questions, so we can kind of answer those now. Um. All right. Oh my so, gosh, sorry, I just saw your chat. I didn't turn on the closed caption. No, oh, that's okay. That. No worries. Um. So for uh, there's a, a just a comment when uh, that somebody wears a bike helmet when working at heights, both indoors and outdoors. Um. So thinking of falls, some preventative measures. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts as far as just in general some protective equipment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when you're uh, working at heights, absolutely, that is definitely uh, going to be a bit more of a challenge. So there should be some extra precautions to make sure that you have some safety equipment on. So that's fantastic that you're uh, wearing that. Even if you had some sort of um, tether as well, I think that would be a good safety um, precaution as well. I'm not too familiar with working at, at heights though. So um, making sure that kind of you're just following recommendations uh, from uh, whoever you're working with as well. Um, the 30 seconds at the same test, you did 12. Is that okay? That's great that you did it. Um, hopefully that you found that to be okay. 
um, I can I can link the um, link to those no, that normative data from uh, those tests as well. We can check that out. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure about the score there. So um, I'll, I'll, we can send you that link so you can come and take a look. Um, in general, to summarize, what are the main components to reduce your risk of falling? Uh, so like we talked about, you want to kind of first assess your risk, uh, chat with your um, healthcare provider and healthcare team about your risk and what you can do to reduce your risk. Um, assessing yourself as well with, with a healthcare professional and your team to see where you might have deficits, what you might struggle with in terms of your physical fitness, your vision, um, hazards at home is really important. So just to kind of assess. And then once you have an idea of what you need to work on, then you're going to intervene. Then you're going to make a plan with your healthcare team and see what's going to be most important for you to reduce your risk. So uh, regular exercise, no matter what, it, even if you feel like with your team, you're not at risk, is going to be probably one of the most important components, I would say. Oops, go back. Um, is Tai Chi a good exercise to increase balance? Absolutely. That is a really great exercise um, that can help you to improve your um neuromuscular control it is nice and controlled but it also uh challenges your, your balance and your stability many different postures um it's very smooth it's, it's a really great exercise honestly so i would definitely recommend if that's something you enjoy to participate in that um is outdoor cycling too risky for seniors just in general i think it depends on um your individual situation and uh, uh, your physical capacity and your physical fitness. So something to assess with, with your team um, to see. If it's something you've been doing and you've been doing great, it may be okay to continue. But I think if it's something that you haven't been doing and you want to maybe start, it would be best to go kind of uh, assess that with your, your healthcare team. Also, where are you cycle in Toronto? Also matters yeah, <laughs> here in the city. That's a really good point. Safety. To be honest, I am not the most confident cycler, but I don't trust other people on the road. That's my biggest thing. So uh, trails, that's a really good idea. Marcia. Like that, Some of the trails that we have are, uh, are really nice. They're a little bit more calm too compared to, you know, downtown with the um, streetcar tracks and everything. So that's a really good point. Um, are you familiar with Japanese Taiso mobility routine? I'm not sure. I would I would love to hear more about that. If you wanted to um, shoot me an email about that, I, I'm I'm definitely not familiar with that. But it uh, it sounds uh, it sounds really intriguing. Um, any thoughts on yoga and helping with falls? Uh, seated yoga. I see. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming maybe this meaning uh, having difficulty with standing positions. Um, and yeah, ab absolutely. So um, focusing on maybe some regressions, if you're doing yoga on your own, or if you're doing a class, uh, the instructor hopefully can help you with some uh, regressions so that they are kind of appropriate for you. And you can maybe progress to more challenging ones. So seated positions, maybe even uh, if it's accessible for you, kneeling positions that are a little bit close to the ground might be a good way to progressively uh, improve your strength and your balance before you go into some standing. Because there's a lot of positions that are single leg and really challenging for sure. Um, great question. Mentioning uh, You mentioned talking to a physical trainer. Where can we consult? Uh, such a trainer. So on this slide I have here, we actually have an offer for all of you um, today. If you're interested in coming in for a complimentary a fitness assessment, where we kind of assess a lot of the, all the things I talked about today. Um, so this would actually be a free month of a membership at any of our body and soul fitness locations. We have one that's close to the Toronto Rehab Center. It's located at Leslie York Mills. Um, we also have one in Forest Hill at Eglinton and Avenue. And then my location is down by the distillery district at Front and Berkeley. Um, but we are offering like a free month of membership uh, and then a complimentary fitness assessment as well as a complimentary personal training session. So, um, if you are interested, I have the link here. We'll be sure to uh, get all the links to you that are in this PowerPoint. 
Um, but yeah, so I hope that you uh, take us up on that offer. We'd love to see you and love to help you kind of get started or restarted on your fitness journey. Um, six minute walk. So I, I'll send you again the, the link that has all those norms. I just don't have uh, it off the top of my head. So I'll give you that so you can take a look. Um, can you get a fall assessment test at the cardiac unit of UHN? I think that'd be a question for Marissa. Thank you for getting I mute myself. Um, no, okay. we don't do uh, falls assessments here at our center. Uh, are like stroke rehab, typically they do, but as part of uh, a client's or a patient's program uh, post-stroke. Um, I see. Yeah. Um, any suggestions on how to best increase VO2 max? For sure. So that would be primarily uh, done through aerobic training. Um, what we talked about, that kind of dynamic, full body um, rhythmic movement that gets your heart rate up. I would say... Um, one of my best suggestions, if you're getting started with this is try not to push the intensity too much so that you can get, um, uh, more duration because that's really, really where we get the benefit to, uh, increasing our body's ability to deliver and use oxygen. It's kind of what our VO2 max is. So, um, if you are able to walk, if you're able to do aerobic exercise in the pool, if you're able to cycle, whatever you like the best would be the best way to go about it. Because if you don't like something, you're probably not going to do it. Um, so yeah, whatever activity uh, is accessible to you and that you enjoy. And starting slow, maybe you're doing a little bout. If you're walking, it doesn't have to be for an hour right off the bat. Maybe it starts with 10 minutes and you try to add some time each time as you feel better. Um how can I tell whether I'm training too much speed walking for two hours at 10 minutes per kilometer? Um, that's a great question. Honestly, that's something that a lot of people do not consider and recovery is really, really, really important to your progress. So there's no like simple answer to that, but the best way to see if you are overtraining is considering your recovery. And what I mean by that is um, if you, your sleep's impacted, if your nutrition's impacted, if you're irritable, if you feel like you're sore all the time, you're dragging your feet, you're struggling through your workouts, you have low energy. These are all signs that maybe some aspect of your recovery isn't kind of where it needs to be. It's not optimal. Um, and that's going to imp impact your training and pro probably like most aspects of your life. So uh, those are the best things to kind of take a look at. And they're definitely very individual. So if you are training a lot, nutrition is going to be really important. Sleep's going to be really important. Um, and they always are. Those things are always very important. But uh, yeah, kind of taking a look at those things and seeing how you're progressing and how you're feeling. Um, would you recommend any fall prevention programs in the city, including the personal training offer? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of exercise, uh, I believe the best way to get started is with an individualized approach where you are seeing an exercise professional who can take a look at um, you, do some assessments, and then go from there, right? Classes are fantastic, but it might be a good idea to kind of see where you're at first to see if that's going to be an appropriate intervention for you um, because there's so many individual factors that will impact what is right for you. So in our assessment, we take a look at certain health metrics. We look at blood pressure and heart rate, uh, body composition, if that's something you're interested in. But then we do a lot of tests for uh, your balance, for your core. We take a look at um, the tension and the mobility of individual muscles, uh, which we kind of take a look at your structural balance so that we can design a program that's really targeted for you, um, taking into account any injuries you may be dealing with, and then going from there. Um, so that's, that's my best recommendation. And then uh, your, your trainer can definitely come, can design a, a plan, an overall plan that is best for you. And that includes uh, all the aspects of recovery I talked about too. Um, good question about stretching, very important before or after workout. So yeah, really great question. Um, both. So the parameters just change a little bit. Before a workout, especially a strength workout, uh, really, your goal is to prepare your body for the exercises that you're going to do in that workout. So if you are really tight somewhere, 
um, and you have, have difficulty getting to a certain range, it might be good to spend some time doing some soft tissue release and some, some stretching because um, that will allow you to get into a better range and then you can build strength in that range through the workout. So really common one is like chest. Our, our chests are typical really tight. We're kind of forward rounded. And then if you wanted to do some sort of pushing exercise, a push up or some sort of dumbbell press, if you loosen up that soft tissue, stretch out the chest a little bit, you might be able to get more of a range and that might help with your posture. Um, we don't wanna stretch too much before a workout because if we kind of, it's like an elastic band, our muscles. So if you think about if we stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch, it, there's only so much we can do with an elastic band before it kind of loses its ability to come back. And so that's basically our muscles ability to recoil and to produce power. So it can be detrimental if we stretch too much before a workout. So, you know, generally 30 seconds per muscle group before a workout works well for a lot of people. And then after you can stretch as much as you like, and it's really good because you're warm. Um, so it might be even more effective. Or if you're uh, just stretching on a, on a rest day or something, then you can kind of stretch as much as feels good until you kind of notice a change. Yeah. Um, have I worked with cardiac patients before? No, I haven't personally worked with cardiac patients before. Um, is it okay to take vitamin D in the summer along with frequent exposure to sun? Uh, again, something to talk to with your uh, healthcare provider, but I believe it is okay to supplement year round with vitamin D. Maybe it's less necessary if you do get more exposure to the sun, but uh, sunscreen can block your vitamin D absorption and sunscreen is very important for other reasons. So um, again, just something to check with your healthcare provider. Uh, that might be, um, if you get some blood work done, you can kind of assess like your levels and kind of go from there with your, with your doctor. Are there exercises to practice getting up after a fall? Um, I see. So like if you do fall and getting up, um, so I, I guess that depends. Like if, if there was an injury when you fell, that might be different. But if you had a fall and you're okay, um, I would say lunges are very important and pushing um, exercises because you can help to kind of push yourself up off the ground core exercises, and then a, a lunge would be very important, lunges and, and squats for sure. But if you if there was any injury, um, that would definitely be something to go through with uh, your team because it's uh, important to kind of rehab that. Um, you like walking on tracks. Can you suggest a good track? Me too. Tracks are nice. It's, it's really nice to be outside. Um, I'm not sure where you live, but I have one close to me here that's at Sumac in Shooter. Um, but sometimes uh, certain high schools do have tracks. Um, there's a track at York University, uh, one at Birchmount, which is kind of more East End. Um, and I think most of them are accessible like to the public unless they are um, closed off for some event or something in, in my experience, yeah. Uh, is there a way to fall safely? Um, so it, it's tricky, right? Because it, often when you fall, you're not expecting the fall. So that's why balance and um, agility exercises are so important to basically challenge your stability and um, change your inputs and challenge your um, like visual input so that you're more prepared and more ready to catch yourself uh, in in an instant where uh, you do fall. Um, so I'd say maybe, I'm not sure if there's a way to fall safely because often it just takes you by surprise. Uh, if you are in the midst of falling, uh, you can try and um, protect your head, but at the same time, it's kind of hard to control what your body does when you are falling because it is trying to protect you. Um, often you'll people may put out a, uh, um, an outstretched hand, and that can lead to some kind of um, arm injuries. But um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't, I'm not really sure about that. If, unless we have like crash mats all over your house, I'm not yeah. sure. That's probably not reasonable. So I know the the stroke rehab program does um, does have like a, a fall practice, but they're, oh, you know, again, it's part of like, their particular rehab program post falls and that and they're very high risk of falling so usually there's like a harness and mats and that sort of thing 
Um, there are some hospital programs you can ask your family doctors to be referred to that are particular false prevention where they will like work through how to get up from a fall. Um, and a lot of it is also included in what you've talked about today, Amanda, like mm -hmm. all, all of that, uh, yours is probably way more about like the preventative, whereas mm -hmm. theirs looks at preventative, but also uh, on the, if you're, like I said, if you're a high risk of falls, uh, they, they can work with you as far as um, what to do when you fall. Um, right. So that could be a discussion with your primary care provider. Uh, if you're thinking yeah. you need something a bit more um, recovery wise that way. Mm -hmm. 100%. Thank you so much for your time, Amanda. We really, really appreciate it. Um, any other thoughts on your end that you'd like to mention? No, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all the great questions. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so we'll end it there. Um, again, thank you, Amanda. Stay tuned uh, as we kind of get things going. We'll let you know if a new uh, talk is coming up. We're doing our best. Hopefully, in the next couple of months, we'll get another uh, talk happening, either virtually or maybe in person, but we'll have to see. Um, but otherwise, enjoy the spring weather. Have a lovely uh, holiday weekend if you're able to, uh, to take part, and we'll see you all soon. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks, all.